Next up, we have Dr. Gregory Brewer, who would be speaking on two very important issues in longevity, brain aging and autophagy. Dr. Brewer works at the Mind Institute at University of Irvine, and he's the person who discovered the secret sauce that makes us, all the cell biology people in the room actually culture stem cells and brain cells, the neuronal cells in a pituitary plate. So, and that also he, maybe if he has the time, he'll describe how it solved all the funding issues he has. So it's my pleasure to welcome Dr. Brewer. I'm gonna show a switch in a minute. So can the aging brain autophagy be rejuvenated and how do we approach this? Uh, those of you working in the field realize that regulation of the cell is a very complicated task. And so I'd like to try to break it down. First of all, what is aging? It's exercise intolerance, disease susceptibility, and possibly the last stage of development. We've begun to recognize how it's programmed and how epigenetics is controlling that program. What needs rejuvenating? Well, we need to attack or repair an impaired blood supply, and that has implications in cardiogenic, vascular, pulmonary, and even aging and Alzheimer's, as I will get into. The immune system needs to be rejuvenated with aging, and there needs to be better turnover and replacement of cell ingredients. And that's where autophagy comes in, where the cell takes out the garbage every day. And adult neurogenesis, which is of keen interest to many here. And there's a metabolic system that needs regenerating. We can operate on glycolysis at a very simple resting state. But when we need, when there's stress, uh, physiological stress, exercise stress, then we need oxidative phosphorylation. And actually, the brain operates mostly on oxidative phosphorylation. And then, how do we regulate all these things? And it's at the heart is an epigenetic regulation, but also a metabolic regulation that I'd like to introduce you to today. And that's the redox state, because this redox state is what controls the metabolic state. It controls turnover and replacement. And I don't think I have this in my slides, but to get neurogenesis, to get stem cell replication, you need a reducing redox state. But to go from that replicative state to a differentiated functional state, you need an intermediate uh, redox state that most of you have right now. But we can have an inflammatory redox state that is oxidized, and that's uh, an impairment and a, a challenge to your body. What is autophagy? Here's the simple diagram where uh, things are taken in from the outside through endocytosis and organelles such as mitochondria get damaged every day and they need to be turned over. So we have these autophagic vesicles that form and then fuse with lysosomes to take out the trash. And this autophagolysosome then digests what's inside, recycles the amino acids, the nucleic acid, carbohydrates, and fats, so the cell can synthesize new macromolecules. Here's the uh, Kyoto Encyclopedia of Genes version of autophagy. So if you were uh, an enterprising young uh, <clears throat> biochemist here, what point in this cascade would you begin to attack? That's a daunting problem, isn't it? You see up at the top here is 
given not equal weight, but up at the top center is an enzyme called AKT, and that is, represents a metabolic regulation of this pathway. And hidden up here, I didn't even see this at the start, is GTP, the guanine equivalent of ATP. So those might be good places to start to regulate all these genes. Um, here's one company's antibody collection that you can start targeting and monitoring each of these if that's the way you want to go. But I think that's a difficult approach. There's also uh, another 30 or so genes involved in endocytosis. And I don't expect you to read what's inside every green box here, but again, which one of these genes are you going to target to regulate the dysfunction that occurs with aging? One good marker that I will uh, refer to is the RAB7 circled there in the bottom, uh, but uh, you could pick almost any marker, I think, here. And then there's another 20 or so genes involved in lysosome processing. So this is a daunting task. Where are you going to start? What are you going to attack? Uh, you can't say, well, I'm going to find a small molecule inhibitor to target that particular protein, because what about all the other ones? So I had to go back to first principles. And the thing that influenced me long ago was Dean Jones' work at Emory, where he looked at redox state in the blood of either glutathione or cysteine. And here's healthy people across our whole lifespan. Look what happens at middle age. Some of you are at middle age and beginning to realize that it's starting to get downhill. Uh, and your glutathione ratio in the plasma is going to reflect that, a redox shift toward an oxidizing level. And cysteine, I disagree with this curve fit. I think it can show the same middle age downward trend. <clears throat> so the, to, to attack this, uh, we developed the ability to culture neurons from any age animal, any age brain cells, independent of age, gives a normal survival curve, and axons and dendrites regenerate in these neurons. Here's from a mouse model that we've used a lot, a triple transgenic uh, change in, uh, pr that promotes Alzheimer disease in these mice and we compare this to non-transgenic. But also I want to bring in the work of Ralph Nixon from NYU, who's claimed uh, very elegantly a number of steps that are defective in autophagy. And I just have time to mention one of these, that the lysosomes in the brain fail to acidify in Alzheimer's disease. So if the lysosome doesn't acidify, then the lysosomal proteases are not activated, and you get a failure, a buildup. And you can see this buildup around this neuron here with the nu nucleus in the center and beta amyloid in green. And the lysosomal markers are all around that beta amyloid, unable to digest this aggregated protein. The other benchmark uh, came when I reflected back on my undergraduate biochemistry, realizing that it's NADH that powers oxidative phosphorylation. That's the primary electron donor. And look at this scale that we live life on from NADH at a high reductive potential all the way down to oxygen that you breathe. And that's what enables our life to exist. But we break it down into bite-sized energy pieces called ATP. This uh, 
began our epigenetic oxidative redox shift theory of aging in which glycolysis is powered by the oxidative state of NAD and you don't get any benefit from sugar producing ATP unless there's a reductive, an oxidative reduction reaction that occurs. What is the cell going to do with the by byproduct of NADH? Well, it makes two ATPs from glycolysis of one molecule of glucose. But if, if the NADH is funneled into the mitochondrial electron transport chain, you get 36 molecules of ATP. And that's a lot more energy, as you can imagine. Now, if the, there's a shortage of oxygen, as we heard this morning earlier, or there's uh, damage, oxidative da re uh, ROS damage to the mitochondrial electron transport chain, or in heavy exercise, then the NADH is recycled to NAD and lactate is produced. And that's why if you exercise strenuously, you get pain in your muscles and you have to uh, reach that point of, of stopping exercise. The cell has a third pathway of these NADPH oxidoreductases. There's many of them. So that will recycle the NAD, but it produces a lot of oxyradicals in the process, in the expense. So those are the fundamentals. Oh, and then there's the uh, crab tree effect, where if you give a lot of sugar, you can live off of glucose uh, energy production very simply. But if you uh, take away or just lower the glucose, then you induce oxidative phosphorylation. And my contention or hypothesis is that's good for you. And the sugar is, living off of sugar is not so good. So here's the first experiment I'll describe out of about four that I have time for. To look at the relative importance then of NADH on the one hand and the redox buffer of glutathione inside the cells on the other. Easy way to think of it is NADH is like the currency that you use. It's like a bank account, your credit card. Um, but glutathione is, is like your savings account. It maintains the balance that you can go to any time. So if we inhibit here uh, the production of NADH and you can see the, as we increase the inhibitor, we lower the NADH levels, and we can compare, measure the glutathione levels at the same time in <clears throat> biofluorescence measurements, and we can then transform this into the relationship of what happens when you lower the NADH levels. You also get a lowering of glutathione, so they're related, but how far does it go? Well, we want to know that in terms of neuron death. At the limit, the neuron death here drops from a low levels and goes up to high levels of neuron death as the NADH uh, is lowered. The complementary experiment is to inhibit, inhibit the glutathione production, and we see here uh, glutathione goes down with BSO inhibitor. And coincidentally, the NADPH goes down. So they're interrelated, but who's to have the priority? Here's the relationship of glutathione to NADPH. And you can see the, with the extra burden of the amyloid genes in the transgenic model, you lower the NADH more quickly. Here's the summation that if we lower glutathione, we get more death. And comparing the death here to the death here, which is worse, 60% or 40%? 
So the glutathione is a bigger factor. And you can look at the numbers here and see that 60% uh, is worse than 30% in normal mouse neurons. But in the transgenic, it's even more severe effects. So this leads us to the conclusion that NADH is upstream of glutathione. And when you regulate the NADH, you can control the cellular redox state and the health of the brain cells. <clears throat> the second uh, line of experiments uh, came out more recently with um, a postdoc, Crystal Pontreo. And we looked at mouse brains for comparing that AKT level of metabolic state and A beta production, because we have a, a hard question here of the chicken and the egg. And I submit that it applies to every aspect of aging. But in Alzheimer's, the question is, does A beta overproduction or deposition cause accelerated aging? Or is it the accelerated aging that's causing increasing the A beta production? Because people who have genes that are mutated that will inevitably cause an overproduction of A beta in old age. Those people live a perfectly normal, young, youthful existence. You have the gene for Alzheimer's. Why don't you get it expressed? Why doesn't it have an impact until you get old? So maybe there's an aging component that goes into that accelerated uh, production? Or does age-related metabolic signaling affect the cause? Because we all know when you get older, you don't have as much energy as you were younger. Or more specifically, does an oxidative redox shift that I showed you from Dean Jones' work, does that accelerate the A-beta production or over or deposition? So here's the uh, graphical abstract that allowed us to ex uh, produce this time series where young animals have, <clears throat> in Alzheimer's, an oxidative redox shift. I'm not doing that intentionally, I'm sorry. <clears throat> and that there is an effect on the metabolic AKT level signaling. There is an effect on A beta, but it occurs later and other pathologies, and there is a down, very late downstream effect on plaque deposition. <clears throat> so what is this oxidative redox shift? If we look <clears throat> at A beta levels here in these mice, we see uh, no effects at young ages, and then the A beta builds up inside the neurons first before their extracellular depositions. And that buildup occurs uh, with another marker of, of amyloid, aggregated amyloid, from Charlie Glabe, our collaborator. And when we look at glutathione levels then with age, we see this big drop in the transgenic animal early on. And that drop is not equaled until middle age of the non-transgenic animal. But it is a downhill process here of loss of glutathione. And we can, every time I move the cursor, <clears throat> we can then also correlate the A beta intensity with the glutathione levels. A big, this is a reverse scale, a big drop in glutathione before there's the first perceptible change in A beta levels in the brains of these animals. But when the glutathione levels drop further here in middle age, nine to 12 month animals, that's where the intracellular amyloid begins to accu accumulate. <clears throat> How important is this redox state to NADH substrate supply to oxidative phosphorylation? To do this, uh, we use fluorescence lifetime imaging inside these cells. And we find, actually, we can see inside individual mitochondria and look at the NADH levels. And here's 
<clears throat> our resting metabolic state at a, about a minus 50 millivolts. <clears throat> and young animals can be pushed in either direction to have a slightly higher NADH levels or greatly worsened just by shifting the redox state. How do we shift the redox state? It's very simple. We add oxidized, gluta, oxidized cysteine, and that's called cysteine. Outside the cell, this is what is in your plasma controlling the redox state systematically, but if you add it in vitro here, we can shift the young one to a more oxidized state. <clears throat> in the old animals, the shift is greater, and you see this lower resting NADH state in the <clears throat> old animals, and that can be worsened and, as I showed before, uh, cause cell death by shifting to even lower NADH levels. Now here's the re first rejuvenation example. By adding the reducing amino acid, cysteine, we can bring old neurons back to the healthy NADH levels here of young neurons. And that happens over a time period of just 6 to 12 hours. So that's a remarkable rejuvenation. <clears throat> Reductive restoration of the mitochondrial free NADH levels and the pool size. Here's the pool size of total NADH. <clears throat> and you can see uh, the young ones, that the old ones here brought up almost to the level of young animals. <clears throat> What is powering, or what can the cell do with this extra energy from NADH? Well, it could make more, NA, more ATP, but you've already got enough ATP, you're alive. Uh, but what about GTP? That term tends to be more regulated. And in fact, all the processes of autophagy, all these microvesicles handling is controlled by GTP levels. So there's this segregation of energy charge that is used to power these. And the uh, RAB GTP aces that are necessary for these processes are in red here. So they're all over the vesicular handling of, of uh, autophagy also the lysosomal transport on the microtubules as well as microtubule assembly shown here. And in addition, controlling mitochondrial fission and fusion requires GTP. And here's the motility of the vesicles to bring them into contact for the fusion event. So to study this, we took advantage of a new uh, <clears throat> protein probe, a GTP sensor, or a GVAL, so GTP evaluating protein, developed by Mikhail Nikoforov, and this works by exciting the, this probe at either 405 or 488, and we can measure then free GTP or bound GTP. And here's uh, some of the results from postdoc Ricardo uh, Santana, looking in young cells, middle-aged cells, and old neurons. And first of all, you can see that the GTP levels are not uniform throughout the cell. They're at the periphery and in certain organelles, including the mitochondria. And in middle-aged neurons, there's an increase of GTP levels throughout the cell. And in old neurons, it goes way down. What's the case 
in, <clears throat> if you look at the bound or the free ratio, it's the opposite uh, areas. So very localized uh, places for GTP to act. That's what you need for endocytosis. That's where the localized energy is needed. And here's the statistics on the GTP free levels. In the non-transgenic, the same experiment. In the transgenic animal is more acute. And we can see this uh, rapid decline with age with the additional burden of the A-beta genes. So how can we boost NADH levels besides just uh, reductive cysteine? Well, NADH levels from uh, the popular magazines are going to help everything in your whole body. It's magic. But uh, it's not quite that simple. So in the brain, I mean, in your body, every cell, here's the NAD. There's three ways to make it. The de novo pathway from tryptophan, the salvage pathway from nicotinamide and nicotinamide riboside, and that can convert, uh, be, be made into NAD and uh, replenish your NAD levels. In the mitochondria, the NAD can be transformed into NADH and power oxidative phosphorylation. <clears throat> but oxidative phosphorylation generates oxyradicals. So just making more energy has a cost. How can we mitigate the expense of that cost? Well, there are small molecules uh, that we want to use to restore ATP capacity and GTP levels. One of those is a NERF2 inducer. NERF2 exists in the cytoplasm, bound to a restraining complex, but it's activated by specific inducers to be a transcriptional regulator of a number of redox genes. They're called misnomer uh, antioxidant redox uh, elements, uh, but they're really uh, redox genes that you can see listed here, discovered by comparing Nerf to knockout mice, which genes were affected. And you can see the NADH quinone oxidoreductase goes up fivefold. These are big changes that we can manipulate then to control the oxyradical damage that would go up with increase. And surprisingly, uh, Ricardo found that that uh, increase can occur with a NERF2 inducer in just 30 minutes, adding it to the cells. And here's uh, another experiment where we looked at A beta levels in, I'm sorry, in the cells uh, treated with vehicle. It's going back again. Treated with vehicle or a NERF inhibitor, an NAD precursor, or the combination. So you can see the combination here works synergistically better than either one alone. And these small molecules then are able to also restore these GTP levels that I was talking about. And here's the restoration that Ricardo has me measured in old neurons, even in the triple transgenic. <clears throat> he also uh, showed the enzyme mechanistically involved in this restoration as uh, this enzyme got a, a name because it was a non-metastasis gene that converts ATP to, to GTP. And there's a number of these that then with RN, siRNA, he was able to lower the GTP levels except in the old. 
So we have a bit of a puzzle to complete here to look at some of the other isoforms. And he then uh, did a control experiment inducing autophagy with rapamycin. And you see immediately the GTP levels go way up. So it's a GTP dependent autophagy. Or if you can inhibit, <clears throat> I'm sorry, this is the inhibitor. Uh, the GTP levels go up. If you promote autophagy, GTP levels go down. And same effects, although moderated because of other effects in the old neur neurons. Here's the uh, lysosomal fusion then with the early endosomes, and that goes up, or that starts out high in these young non-transgenic animals, but when they're treated, the process is better able to be completed. And the parallel experiment in the old, where there's not a, very much autophagy going on, when you supply these precursors of NAD, then you can get more GTP and better complete the autophagy. So how does aging, to wrap up here, how does aging promote AD amyloid pathogenesis? How does aging promote AD related susceptibility to stress? Like our other publications have shown, lactic acid acidosis, hypoxia, and glutamate. How does it control membrane potential? I haven't had time to uh, tell you about that. And reliance on glycolysis for the crab tree effect. There is an age-related metabolic shift that's enforced by epigenetics. And just uh, one cautionary note here, if you want to work on the other end, uh, you can adopt a sedentary lifestyle. And this recent report out of San Diego, Shadjabs studied uh, with an accelerometer on people's hips uh, how much activity they were engaging during the day. And here, uh, with medium velocity accelerometer, people in this study of 5,000 women, old women, were able to reduce their risk of death by 50%. So you wouldn't know this until you were part of the cohort where half of your colleagues uh, died, the other end of the spectrum, people who had 50% uh, <clears throat> less activity in the x-axis. I don't know if you can read this, but this is uh, minutes per day of sedentary activity going up to 60, 600 minutes, so 10 hours, basically sitting on the couch all day. Uh, you can raise your risk of mortality by 50%. And the colored lines here rec represent GWAS SNPs for longevity. So the longevity genes did not modulate these effects very much. It's all much stronger effect by your activity and your exercise. Exercise helps with health span more than good genes. In conclusion, low energy in old neurons is reversible by a shift to an from an oxidative redox state to an oxidized exogenous reducing cysteine action. We can also apply an exogenous boost in reductive energy, H energy with a precursor or a combination of precursor and NADH inducer to handle ROS. And these deficits in autophagic clearing in old age, they can be reversed by a combination of an NAD precursor and a NERF2 inducer to handle ROS. Can aging autophagy be rejuvenated? My uh, hypothesis and my latter last aim in life is possibly if we can get the right dose of small molecules into the brain, not just into your mouth, 
and combine that with diet and exercise, I think this will promote a good health span. Thank you for your attention.